This is your brain on risk. This is Mind Over Money, the podcast where Kevin Cook exposes the psychology of investing. Welcome back to Mind Over Money. I'm Kevin Cook, your field guide and storyteller for the fascinating arena of behavioral economics. Last week, the price of Bitcoin, that invisible cryptographic currency which exists only in the cyberspace of computer networks, crossed an amazing threshold of $7,000. Given predictions over the past year that it could go to $100,000 and higher, this fact may not seem all that amazing. But a year ago, it was trading under $1,000, and just four months ago, it was only at $2,000. So that pace of roughly doubling every quarter is pretty amazing, and downright scary to those who are afraid of missing out. Speaking of scary, the impetus for the surge from 6000 to almost 7500 this month was an event that took place on Halloween. The world's largest regulated derivatives exchange, CME Group, announced that they would be launching a Bitcoin futures contract before year's end. This powerful blue-chip entrant into the Wild West markets of Bitcoin instantly gave that market a new legitimacy and a brighter future. Because one thing that Bitcoin markets had constantly dealt with for the past six, seven, eight years was unreliable exchanges getting hacked and people losing their money. Creating a Bitcoin futures contract on a centralized exchange where the CME would act as the intermediary to guarantee transactions and settlement would add new levels of security, transparency, liquidity, and price discovery that the scattered network of small, unregulated exchanges could never achieve. But some observers are still skeptical. While CME Group is simply doing what Goldman Sachs had been thinking about for a few months when that blue chip bank pondered a trading desk for Bitcoin cash and derivatives, and what LedgerX is doing with with Bitcoin options, some see it as a trap for the small investor. Not an intentional trap, but one of their own making, Lured by the promises of riches and never having traded a futures contract before, they will suddenly be allowed to gamble on an asset they probably don't understand. The skeptics look at what's going on as wild speculation, a mania, a bubble in the making. And they don't want to see it take the hard-earned money of hopeful investors with lottery tickets in their eyes. The CEO of one of the world's largest banks probably agrees. In September and October, When Bitcoin was bouncing between $3,500 and $5,000, Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan called it a fraud. I'll share Mr. Dimon's argument in a moment. First, let me tie up some loose ends from last week. Uh, Last week, we talked about the AI investing platform called Qplum. And I want to make something clear that maybe I didn't. Their models only use ETFs. Um, so you should definitely go on the Qplum site and, and learn more about their model. I think it's, I think it's really fascinating, and I want to definitely I, – I plan to explore it more. Because I, I, what I did, I, I sort of suggested – I was talking about different growth stocks and the art of investing that is not purely quantitative. I'm not using AI to look at you know, uh, valuations and balance sheets. Sometimes there's this, this qualitative aspect that makes you buy a stock like – Alibaba or Facebook or Tesla uh, or NVIDIA. So I was trying to differentiate the art of the stock picker from what Qplum does, but I need to be clear that they don't buy individual stocks. They just invest in ETFs. So uh, in that sense, there there is no competition. So I just wanted to clear that up from last week. All right, back to Mr. Jamie Dimon and his view of Bitcoin. So uh, this is from a CNBC article I think by Jeff Cox, after the Delivering Alpha conference, which was uh, September 12th. This is Jamie Dimon. It's just not a real thing. Eventually, it will be closed. And that's what Dimon was saying about Bitcoin. Dimon joked that even his daughter bought some Bitcoin, looking to cash in on a trend that had seen it soar more than 300% this year. I'm not saying to go short Bitcoin and sell 100000 of Bitcoin before it goes down. This is not advice of what to do. My daughter bought Bitcoin. It went up, and now she thinks she's a genius. And apparently, he was in an, at another conference earlier in the day, and he compared Bitcoin to the tulip bulb craze of the 17th century, the Dutch mania there. It's worse than tulip bulbs, he said. 
It won't end well. Someone is going to get killed, Diamond said at a banking industry organized by Barclays. Okay, so that was the other conference he was at. He said, currencies have legal support. Bitcoin will blow up. Diamond also said he'd fire in a second any J.P. Morgan trader who was trading Bitcoin, noting two reasons. It's against our rules, and they are stupid. <laughs> now, just to flesh out part of his, his argument here, um, you know, he, I mean, being one of the largest banks in the world, of course, he has faith in the central banks uh, of governments and the fiat currencies they create. But he also knows you don't go up against a government when it creates its own currency. The government... A government creates a currency, and then they have a vested interest in protecting that currency. So what he's saying is, is that um, any government can come in and make Bitcoin illegal or restrict it in some way, and so people could you know, lose their money. Obviously, China has tried to clamp down. Um, the U.S. has its own restrictions, but it's still interesting to note that here, the largest futures exchange and a, a regulated entity with a pristine record of... Um, you know, never failing counterparties that trade has has come in and given this new legitimacy to uh, to Bitcoin uh, and providing a market. and And the thing is, is the the exchange won't lose money because the futures contract they're creating is cash settled, and they require margin money from traders to trade. What What's interesting is that if you look at the historical volatility of Bitcoin, it has to border on seventy or eighty percent. Which means, you know, CME hasn't told us yet what the size of the contract will be, but you know, if they made it something like a hundred thousand dollars, if they just valued it that way, you're trading a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, as opposed to a finite amount of Bitcoins. I, you know, I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but in any case, the uh, whatever the, the whatever the size the contract value is, however big it is, the margin requirement, the, you know, the, basically the performance bond to be allowed to trade a single Bitcoin could be as high as 25% of the value of the contract. You know, that's what you'd have to post as margin collateral um, to have the right to trade it just because it's so volatile and a, a one-day swing could, you know, could wipe out many thousands of dollars. So it'll be interesting when uh, CME releases the contract specs for that, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll be on the lookout for that. All right, so... What else is interesting is about the straight shooting talk from Jamie Dimon on Bitcoin is that also in the month of October, his firm, J.P. Morgan, launched a blockchain platform of their own called Quorum, Q-U-O-R-U-M, based on the distributed ledger technology, DLT, of another cryptocurrency called Ethereum. We'll come back to what DLT means, and we'll talk about Ethereum, too. So I think this added more enormous legitimacy for cryptocurrencies, in, in Ethereum in particular. Um, and I'm going to try and get some experts on the show to talk about specifically about Quorum and what JP Morgan is doing with blockchain. I'll come back to Quorum at the end if we have time. But for right now, we just want to focus on what is blockchain and what does DLT mean? What is a distributed ledger technology? And then we want to compare Bitcoin and Ethereum and how they're different forms of exchanging value, because obviously uh, Jamie Dimon has some views. Let me go back to January of 2016, when J.P. Morgan launched their own uh, first experiment in the blockchain. Um, and I'll just read quickly from this uh, Financial Times article by Ben McLanahan. Uh, Jamie, J.P. Morgan Chase has begun a trial project using blockchain as it seeks to lead banking industry efforts to cut the cost and hassle of trading. The move by J.P. Morgan, the biggest bank, the biggest U.S. bank by assets, is among the clearest statements yet of banks' determination to explore the potential of blockchain, the computer network on which Bitcoin sits. The bank is collaborating with Digital Asset Holdings, the New York-based startup run by Blythe Masters, the bank's former head of commodities. So, Digital Asset Holdings, run by Blythe Masters and J.P. Morgan, are looking at several applications for the technology, including addressing liquidity mismatches in J.P. Morgan's loan funds, which normally let investors take out their money at short notice, even though the underlying assets can be much require much more time to sell. To sell a loan is very cumbersome, a very cumbersome, time-consuming process. Settlement can take weeks, said Daniel Pinto, head of J.P. Morgan's investment bank. 
Exploring alternatives through blockchain makes all the sense in the world. It's easier and faster operationally, and you get fewer mistakes. Blockchain has caught the imagination of the financial services industry within the past year, with a host of companies vowing to find ways to use it to reshape many of their daily operations, from upgrading old back office systems to automatic execution of contracts. The te technology is essentially a digital public database of events that is continuously maintained and verified in blocks of records and shared among various parties. This means payment ledgers can be instantly updated in multiple locations without a single centralized authority. I should note that uh, NASDAQ began a blockchain project back in 2015 called Link, L-I-N-Q, I believe. And just this May, Citigroup joined them as a partner to facilitate settlements. So blockchain is obviously J.P. Morgan. I, I was surprised. I didn't know that they were working on Quorum. And, and I should have known if I would have looked into it more because they'd obviously been conducting a, you know, an 18-month experiment, and then they finally launched their own program. So let me just read this concise definition of blockchain. Um, you know, it seems, seems like this new stuff, you got to hear it over and over again a few times before it sinks in. And this is from Investopedia, I believe. A blockchain is a public ledger of all transactions in a given system that have ever been executed. It is constantly growing as completed blocks are added to it. The blocks are added to the blockchain in linear, chronological order through cryptography, ensuring they remain beyond the power of manipulators. The blockchain thus stands as a tamper-proof record of all transactions on the network, accessible to all participants. The blockchain offers a chance to work at lower costs with greater regulatory compliance, reduced risk, and enhanced efficiency. Now, when I first started reading about this uh, in the past couple of months here, and you know, you're reading about cr cryptography, and it, and it's like, well, hasn't encryption been around, you know, since the beginning of the internet, and aren't things still getting hacked? You know, so that's a that's a fair question for anybody that's setting up a blockchain, operating one, and asking you to transact on it. You know, can these encryptions be hacked? So that's a question I don't have the answer to because that's not my area of expertise, but we're going to find out. All right, so let's get down to what the difference is between Bitcoin, which Jamie Dimon hates, and Ethereum, which he loves. Basically, think of Ethereum as a robust pro programming language and an architecture that has multiple, possibly unlimited, use cases. All right, I made up a simple analogy that may be too simple, but when it comes to abstract technology, simple analogies work. Bitcoin is like an average piece of software with limited applications. And Ethereum is like an operating system from Microsoft or Apple, something a developer can build off of. So I hope that example sort of helps and, and helps you see why Jamie Dimon would call one a fraud and then be using the other one as an architecture for J.P. Morgan's new platform, Quorum. All right, uh, I'm going to be back in a minute with uh, a deep dive into what exactly Ethereum is and what it could be used for. And I will be back faster than you can spell Ethereum. All right, so I hope my analogy helped. I, I said, think of Bitcoin like an average piece of software with limited applications and think of Ethereum as like an operating system from Microsoft or Apple and something that a developer can build off of. Now let's hear from a self-described blockchain evangelist, Amir Rosick. Um, this is a post he wrote on Huffington, um, and you can find him on Twitter, uh, Amir, A-M-E-E-R-R-O-S-I-C. Um, his name is his Twitter handle. And this is what he wrote. Uh, this was... Uh, uh, in 2016, I believe. The first thing about Ethereum is that it is not just a digital currency. It is a blockchain-based platform with many aspects. It features smart contracts, like Ethereum Virtual Machine, and it uses its currency called Ether for peer-to-peer -peer contracts. Ethereum smart contracts use blockchain-stored applications for contract negotiation and facilitation. The benefits of these contracts is that the blockchain provides a decentralized way to verify and enforce them. The decentralized aspect makes it incredibly difficult for fraud or censorship. And I'll just interrupt there for a second. 
Remember, the way the blockchain is working is that multiple computers, possibly thousands, are all verifying the same existence of a digital asset or the same transfer of a digital asset so that, you know, this is this is how it prevents fraud. And yet it's all done through cryptography. So it's it's pretty amazing stuff. Ethereum smart contracts aim to provide greater security than traditional contracts and bring down the associated costs. I should also add something I know about Quorum is that they're not, um, when they're rolling this out for corporations, they're not sharing everything on the World Wide Web. You know, they can sort of create smaller networks of members um, and use, say, a dozen or maybe a hundred members to verify transactions among each other. And uh, uh, another thing, <laughs> since I was an FX trader, what I know, it makes perfect sense that a, a large global bank like J.P. Morgan would come up with, would dive into Quorum and blockchain because in currencies, when you trade in the interbank currency market between global banks, um, everything is based on trust and it's based on a legal contract. So there's always the chance that a bank could fail. Once in a while, banks fail. Lehman Brothers failed, and in just about every decade, there's been some bank failure. And if a bank fails, all of a sudden, you know, for whatever reason, they run out of liquidity, and they're not able to pay on the trades they made last week or yesterday, you lose your money. So this is an advance for, for blockchain right now. I think it'll be able to solve some problems in currency trading right away. Back to Amir's article. The smart contract applications are powered by Ether, Ethereum's blockchain-based cryptocurrency. Ether, as well as other crypto assets, are held in the Ethereum wallet, which allows you to create and use smart contracts. The system has been described by the New York Times as a single shared computer that is run by the network of users and on which resources are parceled out and paid for by Ether. And he goes on here. Ethereum allows you to create digital tokens that can be used to represent virtual shares, assets, proof of membership, and more. These smart contracts are compatible with any wallet, as well as exchanges that use a standard coin API. You can copy the code from Ethereum's website and then use your tokens for many purposes, including the representation of shares, forms of voting, and also fundraising. You can either have a fixed amount of tokens in circulation or have a fluctuating amount based on predetermined rules. So it sounds like the Ethereum platform allows people to create new coin offerings. And you may have heard the acronym ICO for Initial Coin Offering. All right, so now that I've shared some basic ideas about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, I have a question for you. Does this interest and excite you or do you find it boring? If you find it boring, stay with me. I didn't want to hype this technology before I gave a basic explanation. Now I'm going to hype it a little bit in my own words, or at least try to give you a vision of what's coming and inspire your imagination a little bit. Blockchain is going to revolutionize not just finance, but law, medicine, and definitely many aspects of your career could be completely transformed. Think of it this way. Everything valuable is digital, and it's all instantly available to be transferred to someone else for virtually nothing in private transactions with no middleman. Think about how this changes money, medical records, and legal contracts. How does no more physical passports or real estate deeds and paper-based mortgages sound? What if voting in an election could be electronic and secure? What if your ideas, inventions, and other creative assets could be stored securely and verified by immutable records? This is what blockchain does and how it could conceivably work for all kinds of things that we value and contract digitally. Honestly, a few months ago, I didn't even really imagine or think about any of this. I was too wrapped up in artificial intelligence stuff. But it was in my AI quest that helped me stumble upon a group of ninjas who run a podcast called A16Z. That's a lowercase a, the number 16, and a lowercase z. And this group is actually part of Andreessen Horowitz, the venture capital firm. So they do this weekly podcast, and I've just learned a ton of stuff from them. And these guys are advanced. I mean, you listen to one of their podcasts, and whether they're talking about blockchain or AI, you know, it's all going over your head. I've had to listen to a couple of them two or three times just to feel I had a grasp of where they were going. And uh, I, I listened to one in particular where one of the partners, obviously Mark Andreessen is a central partner in 
Andreessen Horowitz. Chris Dixon is uh, is one of his partners. And so the the podcast I just listened to is called Why Crypto Tokens Matter. Now that sounds like a simple title, but believe me, these guys these guys go in deep. And it's uh, Chris Dixon with a guy named uh, Fred Ursham. And Fred was a uh, a Goldman Sachs FX trader, and then he was the co-founder of Coinbase. Now Coinbase is a platform for uh, crypto trading, I believe, and uh, also the exchange of ideas. So check out that podcast. I believe it was September 28th, Why Crypto Tokens Matter. You'll learn a ton. And if, if you're all interested, I, I think it'll ignite your curiosity too. But right now I want to go back a couple of years to a, an article that Mark Andreessen wrote. In January of 2014, he wrote Why Bitcoin Matters. And, and I, going back to this article sort of simplifies things because before you know we started talking about ethereum or wallets <laughs> or exchanges getting hacked or futures contracts or any of that this is when things were still sort of still sort of in their infancy remember the the original bitcoin white paper by satoshi nakamoto i think was his name the uh, fictional person uh came out in you know, the depths of the financial crisis in 2008 or 2009. But then it took a couple of years for, for Bitcoin to really take off and become something that, you know, institutions are starting to look at and hedge funds are being created and people are spending millions of dollars a year to try and mine Bitcoin before they're all found up to 21 million. All right, so let me read from this article by Mark Andreessen, Why Bitcoin Matters, from January 2014. A mysterious new technology emerges, seemingly out of nowhere, but actually the result of two decades of intense research and development by nearly anonymous researchers. Political idealists project visions of liberation and revolution onto it. Establishment elites heap contempt and scorn on it. Uh, yeah, he saw that coming, right? On the other hand, technologists, or nerds, are transfixed by it. They see within it enormous potential and spend their nights and weekends tinkering with it. Eventually, mainstream products, companies, and industries emerge to commercialize it. Its effects become profound. And later, many people wonder why its powerful promise wasn't more obvious from the start. What technology am I talking about? Personal computers in 1975, the internet in 1993, and, I believe, Bitcoin in 2014. One can hardly accuse Bitcoin of being an uncovered topic, Yet the gulf between what the press and many regular people believe Bitcoin is and what a growing critical mass of technologists believe Bitcoin is remains enormous. In this post, I will explain why Bitcoin has so many Silicon Valley programmers and entrepreneurs all lathered up and what I think Bitcoin's future potential is. First, Bitcoin at its most fundamental level is a breakthrough in computer science, one that builds on 20 years of research into cryptographic currency and 40 years of research into cryptography by thousands of researchers around the world. All right, there, yeah, there's the base he's talking about. Like, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It's been developing over time with computer science and cryptography. Bitcoin is the first practical solution to a long-standing problem in computer science called the Byzantine General's Problem. To quote from the original paper defining the Byzantine General's Problem, Imagine a group of generals of the Byzantine army camped with their troops around an enemy city. Communicating only by messenger, the generals must agree upon a common battle plan. However, one or more of them may be traitors who will try to confuse the others. The problem is to find an algorithm to ensure that the loyal generals will reach agreement. More generally, the Byzantine general's problem poses the question of how to establish trust between otherwise unrelated parties over an untrusted network like the internet. The practical consequence of solving this problem is that Bitcoin gives us, for the first time, a way for one internet user to transfer a unique piece of digital property to another internet user such that the transfer is guaranteed to be safe and secure, everyone knows that the transfer has taken place, and nobody can challenge the legitimacy of the transfer. The consequences of this breakthrough are hard to overstate. What kinds of digital property might be transferred this way? Think about digital signatures, digital contracts, digital keys to physical locks or to online lockers, 
digital ownership of physical assets such as cars and houses, digital stocks and bonds, and digital money. All these are exchanged through a distributed network of trust that does not require or rely upon a central intermediary like a bank or a broker, and all in a way where the where only the owner of an asset can send it, only the intended recipient can receive it, the asset can only exist in one place at a time, and everyone can validate transactions and ownership of all assets anytime they want. How does this work? Bitcoin is an internet-wide distributed ledger. You buy into the ledger by purchasing one of a fixed number of slots, either with cash or by selling a product and service for Bitcoin. You sell out of the ledger by trading your Bitcoin to someone else who wants to buy into the ledger. Anyone in the world can buy into or sell out of the ledger anytime they want, with no approval needed, and with no or very low fees. The Bitcoin coins themselves are simply slots in the ledger, analogous in some ways to seats on a stock exchange, except much more broadly applicable to real-world transactions. The Bitcoin ledger is a new kind of payment system. Anyone in the world can pay anyone else in the world any amount of value of Bitcoin by simply transferring ownership of the corresponding slot in the ledger. Put value in, transfer it, the recipient gets value out, no authorization required, and in many cases, no fees. That last part is enormously important. Bitcoin is the first internet-wide payment system where transactions either happen with no fees or very low fees, down to fractions of pennies. Existing payment systems charge fees of about 2-3%, to and that's in the developed world. In lots of other places, there are no modern payment systems or the rates are significantly higher. Bitcoin is a digital bearer instrument. It is a way to exchange money or assets between parties with no pre-existing trust. A string of numbers is sent over email or text message in the simplest case. The sender doesn't need to know or trust the receiver or vice versa. Related, there are no chargebacks. This is the part that is literally like cash. If you have the money or the asset, you can pay with it. If you don't, you can't. This is brand new. This has never existed in digital form before. Bitcoin is a digital currency whose value is based directly on two things. Use of the payment system today, volume and velocity of payments running through the ledger, and speculation on future use of the payment system. Um, just as an aside here, um, and that's what Jamie Dimon is worried about, is that it's just all pure speculation on you know Bitcoin continuing to exist and grow in value and become this platform for exchange. So... You know, that's the part that he's concerned about. All right, back to Mark on Andreessen's article. It's not as much that the Bitcoin currency has some arbitrary value and then people are trading with it. It's more that people can trade with Bitcoin anywhere, everywhere, and with no fraud and no or very low fees. And as a result of that, it has value. It is perhaps true right at this moment that the value of Bitcoin currency is based more on speculation than actual payment volume. And this is Mark Andreessen is talking when Bitcoin was, you know, trading below $1,000. So <laughs> I'd like to hear his most current view. So, uh, but it is equally true, he says, that, the spe- that speculation is establishing a sufficiently high price for the currency that payments have become practically possible. Okay. It's sort of advancing the concept because, you know, when people believe in it and, you know, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon's got a point about fiat currencies, but then again, what's backing them other than everyone's agreement that they that they have value and not just, I mean, yes, a central bank is, uh, uh, issuing bonds and uh, setting interest rates, you know, is a backbone of that. But uh, but fiat is still fiat, um, you know, out of thin air or whatever the Italian word means. <clears throat> All right, back to Andreessen here. The Bitcoin currency had to be worth something before it could bear any amount of real-world payment value. This is the classic chicken-and-egg problem with new technology. New technology is not worth much until it's worth a lot. And so the fact that Bitcoin has risen in value in part because of speculation is making the reality of its usefulness arrive much faster than it would have otherwise. Critics of Bitcoin point to limited usage by ordinary consumers and merchants, But that same criticism was leveled against PCs and the internet 
at the same stage. Every day, more and more consumers and merchants are buying, using, and selling Bitcoin around, all around the world. The overall numbers are still small, but they're growing quickly. And ease of use for all participants is rapidly increasing as Bitcoin tools and technologies are improved. Remember, it used to be technically challenging to even get on the internet. Now it's not. The criticism that merchants will not accept Bitcoin because of its volatility is also incorrect. Bitcoin can be used entirely as a payment system. Merchants do not need to hold any Bitcoin currency or be exposed to Bitcoin volatility at any time. Any consumer or merchant can trade in and out of Bitcoin and, and other currencies anytime they want. Why would any merchant, online or in the real world, want to accept Bitcoin as a payment? Given the currently small number of consumers who want to pay with it, my partner Chris Dixon recently gave this example. Let's say you sell electronics online. Profit margins, profit margins in those businesses are usually under 5%, which means conventional 2.5% payment fees consume half the margin. That's money that could be reinvested in the business, passed back to consumers, or taxed by the government. Of all those choices, handing 2.5% to banks to move bits around the internet is the worst possible choice. Another challenge merchants have with payments is accepting international payments. If you are wondering why your favorite product or service isn't available in your country, the answer is often payments. All right, uh, I'm going to take a break from Mark Andreessen's article here. Uh, it, it's excellent stuff. You can find it on DealBook, I believe. Um, yeah, I believe it was DealBook that published this in January of 2014. And I just wanted to take you back with this to see, you know, where were, where were these ideas, you know, three years ago, almost four years ago, when, when the, the whole market was still really in its infancy. And, and you see Andreessen's vision and how much has come true um, and, and how the things that he's, um, the way he's predicted that this currency could continue to have value and does have value. So, whether Jamie Dimon is right that Bitcoin is a fraud um, remains to be seen. And right now, um, the, the, there's definitely volatility, but um, you know, maybe it does become the platform for something. You know, it's not the same platform that Ethereum is, uh, but it is, uh, it's being recognized and pursued for its potential value and because of what the blockchain will allow companies and institutions to do. All right, fascinating stuff here. I think we'll, we're going to make this a, a part two next week, and we'll come back and finish some key points from Andreessen's article, and then we'll dive into Quorum. And I hope to have uh, a guest. I'm putting the feelers out there for some, for some experts in fintech and possibly the blockchain. Get them on here and, uh, and have them straighten me out. All right, thanks for joining me on Mind Over Money and look forward to talking to you next week.